this message is God wants it all. And so write that down if you guys want to take notes today. God wants it all. Uh, and why does he want it all? Guys, I want to I want to challenge you guys today. God doesn't want it all because he's greedy, because he wants to suck you dry, because he wants to take everything you have. No, he wants it all because he gave it to us. He's the one who has given us everything we have. He's entrusted everything to us. So shift your mindset. You're not an owner of anything. You don't own anything. You are a steward. Write this word down, steward. We are all stewards of everything that God has given us. What is a steward? Someone who manages. Okay, so you have a boss and you manage your boss's finances. You manage your boss's agenda, schedule. You are a steward and God gave it to you. So that's why he's asking for everything back from us. Amen. And everything that we have is literally like on loan from God. Okay. Whether it be our finances, our time, our family, everything is on loan. God is lending it to us and he wants to see what we do with what he's given us. Okay. So today I have a really important question for you guys. And I want you to write this down <clears throat> because you're going to reflect on this question this week. The question is, what do you have? Now, many of you will answer this question differently. Well, I don't have much. I don't have anything. You know, some people I don't have. What do you have? Today, that's what we're going to reflect on. What do you have? Maybe you've heard the saying, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, I have lived this personally in my life, <clears throat> okay? Um, in work, because I had so many talents, guess what? That means I had a lot more on my plate than most other people did, right? I was an administrative director of a preschool, and I couldn't just be a teacher, no, I had to be a director. I had to take, you know, take calls. I had to do finances and budgets. And it, a lot of stuff was on my plate because I had a lot to offer, right? Uh, in school, right? God blessed me. And, and, and in school, I can't just do my work. I had to help others, right? Because there was some other people lagging behind and the teacher would always say, oh, go help them and go be with them and go teach them. And so... To whom much is given, much is required. And whatever God has placed in your hand, he's asking for it back from you. And you may say, well, that's not fair. Some people do less. And no, but God is asking of you. He's requiring of you because he knows what he deposited inside of you. Amen. We're going to turn to Luke 12, 48. Luke 12, 48. Can you guys open that with me? And if you have the same answer, you can read it for me. Um, amen. Amen. But the one who does not know and does everything, does things deserving punishment will be beaten with a few blows. Um, everyone who has been given much will, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much more will be asked. Amen. Let's focus on the last part. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So God is asking more of us. And it's not about a fair thing. No, this is about what God has put in you and he's asking for it back. And you may say to me, well, Lily, I don't have much. But I want to challenge you guys that even though you may not have much, Understand something. This is key. In God's hands, you have everything you need. Amen. You may not have much, but in God's hands, you literally have everything you need. Welcome, Jason. Jason's joining us from the truck. <laughs> I have I have everything. Amen. Amen. Filipenses 4:13. Todo puedo en Cristo que me fortalece. Amen. So guys, we're going to go through a couple of stories from the Bible to really understand this principle. And the first one is the story of the loaves and the fish. You guys know the story of the loaves and the fish? So that's actually found in Mark 6, 38. So you guys, if you want to just open it and leave it there. Mark 6, 38, the loaves and the fish. So in this story, right, Jesus is speaking to a multitude. Thousands of people are there listening to what Jesus has to say. But at some point, right, the people get hungry. 
So what does Jesus tell one of his disciples? What does he tell them? He says to them, go feed the people. Yeah. Go find bread for the people. And the disciples like, are you kidding me? It would take literally a whole year's wages to buy enough bread for the amount of people that were there. Now, let's understand something. In the word, it tells us there were 5,000 men. Yeah. So that means the men, along with their wives, which are not counted here, the children. I mean, you're talking about a really big group of people. And he's like, in order to feed them, it would take a year wage, wages to feed them. But <clears throat> look at verse 38 of Luke. I'm sorry, of Mark 6. Verse 38. What does Jesus ask? He asked how many loaves do you have? Amen. I want you guys to write that down. How many loaves do you have? Jesus knows. Jesus is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He's God himself. But he's asking you today. He's asking you, Ralph. He's asking you, Aylin, Elman. He's asking Tony. He's asking Crystal. He's asking Rebecca. How many loaves do you have? What do you have? Because the first step is us understanding what God has placed and entrusted us with. That's the first step. Us admitting, look, I have this. This is what God gave me. Amen. So what did they end up having? What did they have, Aylin? What did the little boy have? Cinco panes. They had five, and two, five loaves and two fish. That's right. He has five breads. Two fish. Now, there's no way. I don't care how big those fish were. They could be 50 pounders. They could be 100 pounders. There's no way that two fish is going to feed over 5,000 people. No way. But the Bible tells us that they gave Jesus this five loaves and two fish. And Pa, what did he do with this five loaves and two fish? What did he do? Lo multiplicó. He presented it to God. Yeah, and he gave God thanks for what he had. You see that? Amen. He didn't go and complain. He didn't say, well, God, you know, this is all we have. That's it? Really? You can't do better than that? No. Are you guys complaining about what you have? Are you complaining about what God has given you? He's given you exactly what you need. So give God thanks. Give God thanks. I don't care what your bank account says. I don't care what your uh your your check says. I don't care what your the teachers say. God has given you everything you need. Give God thanks for it. And you see how in God's hands he will multiply it. He will provide. He will make a miracle. And so here's Jesus thanking God. Why is he doing this? He doesn't have to. He's doing it to model to us what we need to do. Amen. And he's thanking God and he begins to distribute the fish and the bread. And like I told you, 5,000, the, the Bible says, you can read it right there, Mark 6, yeah. 5,000 men ate. Sin, sin la mujer, eh. Without including the wives and the kids, 5,000 yeah. men ate, but that doesn't finish there. They had baskets left over. That's how much, that's the provision of God, guys. God's provision is so bountiful that not only will you have for you, not only will you have for your cousin, not only will you have for your vecino, but you're going to have left over. Your Amen. cup will runneth over with the provisions of a good God. Amen. That's the type of God we serve. We serve a living God. We don't serve a statue, an idol. We serve a living God. And he's amazing. Amen. Really? So that's the loaves and the fish. Yes, Paul? Ah, con el permiso. ¿Qué tienes tú que ofrecer? Nada, pero Dios te está supliendo a ti mm. para que tú dejes alimento a los demás. You mm -hmm. have anything, you have nothing, pero God give it to you, the great, la autoridad, y tú estás supliendo a la necesidad del pueblo. Amen. And, and God gives us exactly what he determines that we Amen. need. Amen. Not more, not less. Oh, well, well, guys, tent. Why you don't have a thousand turkeys? Well, the need right now is for exactly what God will deposit in our hands. Amen. And we are stewards of that. And we are going to put it where God needs us to put it. Amen? Amen. Let's look at the next story. The next story is the water to wine. Okay. 
So number two, we're going to look at John 2, 6. Now, a lot of people kind of don't understand the significance of this story because they literally just think, okay, it's just Jesus and he's just turning water to wine, period, point blank. Excuse me while I grab a baby. Hi, mama. She wants to be with us today. Oh. All right. So a lot of people think, oh, what's the significance of this water to wine thing? It's it's not a big deal. It's Jesus's first miracle, whatever. It could have been more significant. It actually is very significant. And, and so aside from us understanding that God wants to use what he's deposited in us, I want you to understand the significance of the story, okay? So we're looking at John 2, 6. John 2, 6. So... Jesus is at a wedding, right? And his mother approaches him. Ralph, what does his mother tell him? That there's no more wine. Right. And and to them, it's a crisis. It's a crisis situation because it's an embarrassment. What do you mean? We have a whole wedding, a whole celebration, this whole ceremony, and we completely ran out of wine. We have nothing. This is, it's, culturally, it was just an embarrassment. And Jesus's response was like, woman, like, why are you telling me this? It's not my time. Now, I want to I want to focus on that. It's not my time. It's I not my you. time. Now, Jesus did a miracle. He had compassion and he provided a need in that moment. But we're going to come back to that part that says it's not it's not my time. The question is, what did they have at their disposal? Mm -hmm. Maria, ¿qué tenían? ¿Puedo decir algo? Yes. Amén. Yes. Esa, esa agua era para la purificación de los judíos. Yeah. Amen. Y esa agua yes. para, para ellos la base, Dios la convirtió en mm -hmm. vino. Amen. And that's, that's important. We're going to get back to that. But what did they have? They had six stone jars. We're going to come back to the significance of those stone jars like Papa Yala said. Yes. But they had six stone jars. So Jesus's mom said, listen, do whatever he asks, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And so she knew she had faith that her son knew what he was doing. So what did Jesus tell them to do? He instructed them to fill the water, the stone jars, fill them up. And in the process of filling them up, he asked them to go and start dr drawing the water out and to giving and to start distributing it. So what happens when they take this water and they present it? It was wine. It was El not mejor, only just wine. El mejor vino. The best wine that even the guests said, wait a second, everyone brings out the best wine first and then the other wine after, but, but you guys reserve the best wine for last. What is this? And isn't that beautiful that there was a need, God had compassion, Jesus had compassion, met the need, supplied the need. And now I want to turn to the significance of the story as well. You see, because Jesus in the Bible, we're told that he is the bridegroom, right? And what are we as the church? We are the bride of Christ, right? And, and Jesus here in the story, he tells them, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. What hour? Mm -hmm. What hour? What could he be referring to? Well, I want to tell you that in, in the gospels, in Matthew and Luke, Jesus, when he sat at the table with the disciples in the Passover dinner, what did he tell them? He told them, my appointed time is here. So we we fast forwarding to a time where it was his time. And that was a time where he sat at the table with the disciples. It was his time because he was going to give a sacrifice. Amen. He was about to sacrifice for the sins of the world. And so he sits there and he eats with them. And I want to share with you what he says to them in Luke 22, verse 18. Luke 22, verse 18. Jesus tells them, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. 
So Jesus is sitting at the Passover table with them. He's sitting at, at the last supper with them. He has this wine and he says, I will not drink again until I return, until I'm sitting with you once more. Amen. And we know that the Bible refers to this wine as the new wine, the, the wine of the new covenant. Jesus was about to make a new covenant. And when he took the wine, he blessed it. And what did he tell the disciples? What did he tell the disciples, guys? He said, this is my blood. This is my blood, which I poured out for you. Drink mm -hmm. of it. And, and so Jesus, this is symbolic because Jesus was about to go to the cross to carry our sins, the weight of our sins on his shoulders. And he's taking this wine and he's saying, drink of it. And so when we go back and we see this sim symbolism of Jesus turning this water into wine and he's saying, it's not my time yet. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that because it's all foreshadowing what was about to come, what would happen later on. Now, talking about what Papa Yala said, the significance of the stone jars. Now, these stone jars were used for ceremonial cleaning. Okay. So you walk into a place. And you take these jars and you and you run them across your, your hands and is, you're ceremonially cleaned. Now, Jesus came to change that water, the ceremonial water, into wine. What's the symbolism of that? You see, the ceremonial water is the law. But Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He mm -hmm. came to fulfill the law. That see that? To complete the law. And so now this water, which was the law, is now turned into wine, which is grace. Wine, which is grace. Amen? It's abundance. Understand something, guys. Do you need wine to live? Oh, nope. you need water to live. You need yes, water indeed. to live. Yes, indeed. But Jesus came to give you life and give it in abundance. He came to give you the best. He came to give you more than what we even deserve, more than what we even ask for, because he's a good, good father. Amen. He is a good, good father. Now, I want to tell you something in Mark 22. I'm sorry, in Mark 2, verse 22. Again, going because I just want to focus on the significance of this wine. So you guys understand it's not just Jesus turned water into wine. Mark 2, 22. You see. They're, the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees, they were fasting. But Jesus' disciples were not fasting. And so the Pharisees asked, wait, our disciples are fasting. John's disciples are fasting. Why are your disciples not fasting? Hallelujah. Look at Jesus' response. Look at Jesus' response. Mark 2, verse 22. Jesus says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Now, in order for you to understand what Jesus is talking about, I'm going to go back to verse 19, where Jesus answers, how can the guests, of the bridegroom fast while he is with them. So Jesus was saying, while I'm here present on this earth, you know, Amen. these people are under an old covenant. But when I fulfill my work on the cross, when I am brought up into heaven with my father, I will establish a new covenant. And this new covenant, what did Jesus say he would leave with us? <laughs> Holy Spirit. Yes, the great counselor. And so the Holy Spirit would come and we would be a new creation, a part Amen. of the new covenant, a new creation in Jesus. And when we established ourselves in the new covenant is when he can pour his new covenant, his new grace, his new wine Amen. into a new wine skin, into a new vessel. Now, sorry to go so deep, guys, but I really, I, you have to understand the word of God is so intentional. And when he speaks, don't just read it like a Harry Potter novel, guys. You need to get into it because he's going to reveal to you what he's trying to say. Amen. Hallelujah. So when God is talking about the wineskins, we are the wineskins. We are the wineskins. And the new wine is the new covenant with Christ. 
So he couldn't. The disciples wouldn't understand while he was there on this earth. We had to become a new creation in order for the work on the cross to be complete. In order for him to pour his anointing over us. Amen. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, which makes us a new creation in him, that's how we can receive this new covenant with Christ. So guys, this isn't just about six stone jars. This is so much more. If someone opens this conversation with you, you can share with them, guys, the grace of the new covenant that God was foreshadowing, that Jesus was foreshadowing. Amen? So what do you have? What do you have today? They had five loaves, two fish. They had six stone jars. Let's bring another example. Let's talk about the woman with one jar of oil. The woman who had one jar of olive oil. Now, we're looking at the story in 2 Kings verse uh, chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. And so there's this woman, and she comes to Jesus for help. Her husband died. And her husband owed a debt. And so the creditors came knocking on her door because her husband owed a debt. What did these creditors want from her? Anyone know? What were they asking for? Gift cards, credit cards, cash? The, the two boys. They, these creditors wanted her two sons. Your husband died. He owed us money. And now we will take your two sons as slaves. And so this woman comes to Jesus frantic. Jesus, they're going to take my two sons. My husband died and he owed a debt. And who, what am I going to do? Now, pause right there. Let's look at 2 Kings 4 verse 2. Aileen, do you have that? Second King. Four verse two. Okay, it says, Elisha. Elisha. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Pause right there. Write that down. What do you have in your house? Are you guys seeing a theme? Are you guys seeing the theme? In all of these stories that we're bringing, God is asking, what do you have? What do you have? And so Jesus asked this lady, how can I help you? Oh, my goodness. Jesus wants to help you guys. Jesus wants to do something with you. But he's asking you, what do you have? See that? Because he's going to take what you have and he's going to multiply it. He's going to do something with it. What do you have? And so this lady answers and her answer is, your servant has nothing there at all. That's what she said. Your servant has nothing there at all except, hmm, circle that word except in the Bible, except. You see, you're going to tell me you don't have anything. I don't have the finances. I don't have the smarts. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the, the, the money. I don't have the apartment. Except there is something that you do have. Maybe it seems insignificant, but you have something. And so this lady says, I have nothing except a small jar of olive oil. Now, I don't know if you guys use olive oil. I use olive oil to cook. And olive oil just cooking one thing like you used half a bottle like it, it it does it's very it's small portions right the way they serve because it's expensive i understand that olive oil actually comes from the olive and they press the olive and can you imagine how many olives it takes to create one jar of olive oil? So all she had was one small jar of olive oil but even then you would think well jesus how unreasonable are you this poor widow has only a jar of olive oil. Surely you can provide for her. You don't need to ask her for what she has. Guys, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. See, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It belongs to him. The small jar of olive oil that she had belonged to him. He's asking for it back so that he can multiply it. And so what does he tell her? Jesus instructs her, Go and ask your neighbors. And when I say Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Elisha. Elisha tells her, go and ask your neighbors for empty jars. And so she tells she tells Elisha, look, I only have is this. Elisha says, go ask for empty jars. He didn't say go knock on the doors and ask people for more olive oil. Hmm. Hmm. 
He didn't Hallelujah. say he didn't say go to the bank and ask for a loan. Hmm. He didn't say go call fulano and and ask for a préstamo. He didn't say that. He didn't say go yeah. toma lo fiao. He didn't say that. He said go and ask for empty jars. And what he instructed was Elijah told her, fill these jars with the little with the little olive oil that she had. Use the olive oil. Fill those jars. And guess what? The oil flowed until all the jars were full. Amen. Every jar that she had faith enough to collect, every jar that God permitted her to find, she was able to fill every single one of them until they were completely full. And that oil did not run out until each jar, each last jar was full. And so the prophet's instructions to the woman was, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and your sons will be released from captivity. Amen. What a beautiful thing, guys. I hope you wrote that down. What do you have in your house? What do you have in your house? Now, guys, I don't want to bore you. I just have two more examples for you, and that's it, okay? And this one comes by means of a man named Moses. We're going to talk about Moses' staff. Hmm. Can I just say something before you keep on going, yes. Moses? Yes. Um, Lily says something important. Everything we have is not even ours, so we cannot withhold it from God. You know, it's not ours to begin with, so why not re Return it to God. We have to return it to God. It belongs to Him, mm -hmm. and with the sacrifice that we give back, what belongs to Him, He blesses us with more. I just wanted to put that out there. Sometimes we believe that things belong to us and possessions, but in reality, right, my love, it never belonged to us anyway. Amen. Amen. And that Jason's reiterating a point because he had stepped out. He's reiterating the point that we made earlier that we are not owners of anything; that we're stewards. And we wrote that word down: we're stewards of everything that God has given us. Amen. Absolutely, a hundred. 100% correct. So looking at Moses' staff, let's look at the story in Exodus 4. Open your word to Exodus 4. And here we see Moses standing at a burning bush. And it's the very presence of God speaking to Moses. But Moses, right? He doesn't feel adequate. He doesn't feel good enough. Who is he? You know, who is he? So Moses answers in verse four, chapter and uh, chapter four, verse one, Moses answers, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? Guys, verse two, and I just, I want you to highlight verse two. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Write that down. What is that in your hand? What is it that you already have that I'm going to use for my glory? What is in your hand? You see, God didn't say, I'm going to deposit something brand new. No, what is already there? Because I'm going to use it for my glory. And what did Moses have? A staff. A staff. Something that he used to walk from place to place. Walk the mountains, walk the deserts, just walk. That's all he had, a walking stick, guys. That's all he had is a walking stick. That's it. Right? To push the sheep left and right, it's all he yeah. had. That's it. Simple thing. Simple. What do you have that's simple that God is asking you for, that he wants to use it for his glory? There's something that you have that he's already equipped you with. And so God instructs Moses, throw your staff to the ground. See, sometimes God tells us to do things that just don't make sense. Wait, God, all I have is a stick. And you want me to take the one thing I have and throw it down? Yes. God wants you. He wants your obedience. He wants you to take what you have and give it to him because he's going to use it for his glory. And so what happened in that moment? God tells Moses, throw it on the ground. And what did it become? It became a snake. It became a snake. Now, what's the purpose of this? God displayed his power through what Moses had available to him. You see that? Because Moses' concern was, they're not going to listen to me. And I'm talking like this, but Moses actually stuttered, right? 
he had a speech impediment and so he mm -hmm. he felt really inadequate he's like but, but god they won't hear me how will i talk to them can you imagine listening to someone like that era, era right and so so god is saying right what do you have in your hands and moses said all i have is the stick he throws it down and now god is showing his power god is showing and displaying his power and that's what he wants to do in your lives god wants to display his power with that little thing you have with that thing that doesn't make sense with that thing he's asking you to throw down what is in your hand write that down what is in your hand amen we're only going to do one more guys we're only going to do one more and this one we're talking about elijah not elisha elijah and the widow as Zarephath. okay do you recall the widow as Zarephath? so we're looking at first of kings 1711 first of kings 1711 elijah comes to a place where there's a widow and he asks the widow for something. What does he ask the widow for? Una torta. Una torta. <laughs> he asked the widow for a piece of bread. That's it. Now, initially, he asked the widow for water. He says, can I have water? And the widow went to go get him water. But as she's walking away, he says, oh, yeah, and bring me a piece of bread, too. Now, what's the problem with this? A piece of bread? Go ahead. Go get a piece of bread. But the widow tells him... And verse 12, 1 Kings 17, verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil. There goes a little olive oil, a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. She's saying, like, I'm literally about to give up on life right now, bro. Like, I have nothing in my pantry. I'm going to just have, like, one gandule and just die. And that, But look at the words she's using throughout this whole verse. She's saying, I only have. That means that entails a little. A, a little olive oil. She says, uh, a small jar. A few sticks. She has a little bit of things, guys very small quantities of things but understand what god is about to do for you guys with the little bit that you have so what does elijah tell her does elijah say i bendito mi hija yo no sabía que tenía eso no te preocupes mira que yo voy para el 7-eleven y me compro un sandwichito ahí no te preocupes no he didn't say that Lili, él no le pidió mucho, dame una pequeña torta, no dijo dame una torta grande. Una torta grande. <laughs> right? And that's all she had was a little piece of bread for her and her son. Yeah. So, so God, how dare God ask me? How dare God ask me for a little if all I have is this much? How could God want? How could God want this when all I have is this? How dare God? Well, understand, guys. God is about to do something big with that little thing you have. It belongs to him, guys. Give it back to him. You are only a steward. And so this little thing, this little bread, he goes and says, give it to me. Oh, that's all you have? Just a little oil and a little flour? Give it to me. Wow. Wait a second, guys. You know what the word of God says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all mm -hmm. be added to you. You take care of God's business, and He's gonna take care of you. Bucaria you no take care of easy. God's business. So Amen. the woman, she don't have to worry about eating tonight with her son. Give it to God. Give that piece of bread to God, and God's gonna multiply and give everything that she needs. Amen. So she goes. She prepares it for him, and what happens to the woman? She had nothing to eat and she died that night. No, not at all. Actually, her oil and her flour never ran out. Now, mind you, remember something? They were actually going through a famine at this moment, a famine in the land. And this woman had this little bit of oil, little bit of flour. She had food throughout this famine that many people did not have because why? She gave 
to God what was his. Now, other people that were hoarding, you see that? Other people that were hoarding and not trusting God, they ran out. They were living in a famine. But you and your household will have, in Jesus' name, everything you need when you give it to God. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. I'm not going to have enough money where I don't have enough for school. I don't have enough from work. I don't have enough for Christmas gifts. You worry about God's business. Do not withhold from the Lord. I don't care how tight and financially financially you could be, how, how, how horrible the situation could look, how little and insignificant you have it. Give it to God and give it all. Because when he takes that, He's going to make sure you have everything you need in Jesus name, which brings me to my last point, guys, do not hoard the God's gifts, write that down. Do not hoard God's gifts. Now, if you ever heard this word hoard, you ever seen a hoarder, a hoarder, it lives in a clutter because they like, they can't throw anything out. They just want to hold, 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 hold. You know what story reminds me of the Bible of hoarding? In the 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 people of God, the Israelites, they want they wanted provision from God. They weren't hungry, and so God provided the manna. But God's instructions were: eat of the manna you need for today, That's and it. throw the rest out because I'm going to provide for you for tomorrow. And so God is telling us: don't worry about tomorrow. I got your tomorrow. I'm the future. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I have your tomorrow. But some people decided to hoard and they decided to take the manna, put it in, in their little room and put it under a pillow, hide it somewhere so that You're tomorrow, in case there was nothing, they'd have something to snack on. What happened to that manna that they held on to, Ralph? They got moldy. Those people got sick when they ate the when they ate the manna that they were holding on to. Amen. So understand, don't hold on for things for tomorrow. God has your tomorrow. Okay. Now look at the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents? The Bible calls this man a wicked servant. Why? What did he do? He buried the master's money in the ground. Well, master, I knew you were a, you were a, you know kind of a cheap guy. I knew that you're kind of hard, you know. So I took your money and I put it in the ground so that when you came back, I give it right back to you. God is not asking you to do that. God is not asking you to hoard what He's given you. He's not asking you to bury what He's given you. He's asking you for it. Use it. Use it or else. What does He do to this wicked man? He takes. Takes everything from him. Yeah, I, I said he takes everything from him. He took what this man had and gave it and distributed it amongst the other servants. And this man was cast away for eternity, cast out. Amen. Hallelujah. And so you don't want that to be for you. That's not your story. That's not how your story will end. You're not going to hoard what God's giving you. You're not going to hoard your gifts and your talents and your abilities and your money. You're not going to do that. You're not going to bury it. You're going to use it for God's glory. And one more example. Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira in the Bible? Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. And so what happened to them? They decided, I'm going to sell this property and give it to the church. I'm going to give it to God. And when they came to present the money, they withheld for themselves. What a wicked thing to do. Who told mm. Ananias and Sapphira that they needed to do that? Nobody. Nope. They, didn't, they could have kept the whole, all the money for themselves. But they decided, I'm going to hold a little and I'm going to give a little. But the problem with giving a little, guys, is that God wants it all because he's going to take what you have and multiply it. You see? No but if you don't give him all you have, what is he? how can he do that? How can you reap the benefits of that? And the Bible says they had wicked hearts and they both perished as well. Amen. So guys, I want to share with you this Bible verse in Matthew 5, 14, 16. We're talking about not hoarding. We're not going to hoard our light. Write this down. We're not going to hoard our light. We're not going to hoard our wealth. And we're not going to hoard our time. We're going to share our light, share our wealth, share our time, give everything to God. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. 
Matthew 5, 14 to 16. Here in the verse it says, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. When you take a candle and you light a candle, do you, do you hide it? Do you cover it? Instead, they put it on its stand and give and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not hoard your talents from God. God has deposited something in every single one of us, even if it's a little, and he wants you to use it to shine his light. Oh, but I'm not good enough. And I, I'm, you know, you know, I don't have enough time. Guys, do not hoard it because God wants to glorify. He wants to use that light to shine before others so that others will be saved. You know, Ezekiel 34 talks about the fat sheep, right? There's people that, that they just want to be in church Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they want to keep getting the word, getting the word, getting the word. And they won't share with anyone. Can you believe that? They won't, they won't, they won't tell nobody about Jesus. They're gonna go to church. They don't care about reaching the souls and fishing for men. They don't care about that. But that's not us. The Bible tells us to share our light. And we're also gonna share our wealth. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. And if I'm going quick, Maria's putting these things in the chat. Matthew 6, 19 to 21 says like this in Jesus name do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also what God is saying here guys is don't try to don't try to use your wealth here on yourself. This is temporary. This right Amen. here, this flesh, this is temporary. Don't waste time here on this earth because what you're going to do is you're going to build wealth for the kingdom. When you're doing for God, when you're giving your time to God, when you're when you're when you're doing things for the kingdom, when you're putting your heart into the things of God, you're building up your wealth in heaven for eternity, not for this temporary passing moment. And so don't be one of those people, oh, I don't have a lot, but what I have, I keep it in the bank and it's nice and safe there. And guys, put it in God's hands. He's going to multiply it. Take it from me. I know from experience. And I tell you a hundredfold, God has been with me uh, in ways that no one understands. Why? Because when I was working in the secular, I gave my tithes to God. I gave him no, don't think of a number don't think of a percentage i gave god everything he wanted everything he demanded of me i gave it to him and so now we're no longer working in the secular me and my husband you would say but wait you're not working in the secular you don't have a steady income i don't have a paycheck how are you doing it god you see that god he's amazing and so we stored up wealth with him in heaven and he is my provider he is my supply chain and everything that i need comes from him for the glory of god for the glory of god guys recently someone came with a flooring company who does commercial flooring in businesses and said i'm gonna do your entire apartment completely for free who but god i didn't have to put a penny who but god someone else said come uh, uh, I have a painting business. I'm going to paint your whole apartment for you. I'm not going to charge you for it. Who but God? Guys, understand that he is your provider. And when you hoard on to things, you're putting your trust in yourself. Give it to God and he's going to take it and multiply it and then some. Last but not least, guys, your time. Do not hoard your time. Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33. Ma busca primera vez el terreno de los cielos. Amen. Read it, pa. Ma busca primera vez el terreno de los cielos de Dios y su justicia y todas las cosas serán añadidas. Amen. 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 But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things. All what things? 
all the finances, all the oh. cares, all the concerns, all the worries, mm -hmm. all your housing, all your clothing, everything will be given to you as well. You know, Paul, my what my favorite character Bible uh Bible character said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. Understand something. As as a believer, our goal in life is not to live up in some beautiful mansion, drive a Porsche. That's not our goal in life because our heart is for the things of God. But understand something. You will lack nothing. Everything that you need physically, God will provide for you. And that is his promise. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. God is a good, faithful, and just God. So guys, do not hoard your light. Do not hoard your wealth. Do not hoard your time. Give it to God. Give him your time. Give him your talents, your giftings. Give him your money and he will take it a hundred times further than what you would ever think or imagine. And as we wrap up this, this Sunday message, I want to ask you, what do you have in your house? What do you have in your hand? What is at your disposal? What do you already have possession of? Understand something, guys. Think of it as barn doors. You have something. Something is behind these barn doors. Open your barn doors to God. He will take what he wants to take from there, but he will also fill your barn doors. He's going to fill you guys. He's going to multiply. it. You're going to have so much. You have no choice but to share with others and what God's going to do for you. Amen. Let's give it to God today, and he's going to multiply. Do you guys receive this word tonight, today? In Jesus' Lili, name. Lili. Yes. Pastora Lili, dice la palabra, no he visto justo desamparado ni su simiente que mendigue pan. Amen. That's exactly, yep. That's what Paul said. My boy Paul said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. Let's say a prayer this morning, guys. And the Amen. first thing we're going to say in this prayer is, I'm sorry, God. That's the first thing we're going to say Hallelujah. today. We're going to say, I'm sorry. Why? Because we've hoarded. We've been hoarders. We've been holding on to things selfishly. Talents, abilities, money. There's things that we've been holding on to. And we're going to ask God for forgiveness. And we're going to ask him to help us to see what it is that we have at our disposal, in our hands, in Hallelujah. our house, so that we can give it to him. Amen. Father God, I, I ask for forgiveness this morning. I come to your throne. I come to your presence and it, with thanksgiving God and I just give you thanks for everything Lord in our lives we've lacked nothing God you've provided us everything we've needed but forgive us where we haven't trusted you God forgive us where we fall short God and there's Hallelujah. things that we've been holding on to forgive us for holding on to those things for not trusting you Father God with our talents with our time with our with our finances God they, forgive us for not trusting you wholeheartedly God but today, God, we submit everything we have to you, God. That little jar of olive oil that we have, we give it to you because it belongs to you, God. And you're going to take it and you're going to multiply it, God. You're going to do so much above and beyond what we can think or imagine, God, because your word promises it, God. Hallelujah. Thank That's you for it. everything that you've given us, everything that we have already, and we submit Amen. it back to you. We dedicate it to you, God. We give it onto your throne, Lord. You. And today we ask, Lord, that you do your will with what we have, God. Amen. Make a way, God. Do something like only you can do. Glorify yourself in and through us, Father God. Thank we love you, you with you. all of our hearts, Father God. Be blessed, Father God. We love you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, that every single person in this chat will see an increase in Jesus' name, God. In that area that they've been struggling in, they will see an increase because they will put their faith in you, God. You. Father God, in this moment, Lord Jesus, we're not going to waste time on this earth hoarding things that are temporary, God. Thank that the worms will come and eat it. The maggots will come and the flies... We will not waste time on this temporary thing, God. Help us to be kingdom-minded, God. Help us to think kingdom-wise, Father God, to build your kingdom, God. Soon you will be coming for us, and we will sit at the table with our king. Once more, drink wine, Father God, with you, Jesus. 
Father God, just as your new covenant promises, Father God. We love you, Father God. We adore you, Lord Jesus. And I present all of these things to you, Father God. Every single person here, whatever they're struggling with, Father God, I That's pray that you thing, give God. them the power through your Holy Spirit to overcome, Father God, so that they can trust you and walk in faith wholeheartedly. And even now in faith, I pray for the gift of faith upon every single one of their lives in Jesus' name, that they will leave this Zoom call different than when they entered, Father God, for your glory and your honor. And all these things we pray in your precious and matchless name, Jesus. Amen and amen.